said, there's not a moment. Are you going to go to church today? She said, hush your mouth, Charlotte. Son of you got to go to church. He said, no, Mama. Are you going? And I got two good reasons. They don't like me, and I don't like them. She said, well, Johnny, I understand life is hard, but I got two good reasons why you got to go to church this morning. You're 48 years old, and you're the pastor. It's wonderful to see so many people here this morning, including the pastor. You really want to be here. The central theme of the gospel can be summed up in two phrases. We are loved by God, and that love will flow to our neighbor. Or we can simply listen to the word of Jesus in John 18. The reason I was born, the reason I came into the world, was to bear witness to the truth. Now, the word truth in Hebrew is described by the word emet, E-M-E-T-H, with the H on the end, mute or silent. Emet in Jewish thought means the reliability of God's love. If you met an Orthodox Jew on a downtown street in Los Angeles tomorrow and asked him, what do you understand by the word truth in the Bible? He would answer, a net. That's the reliability of God's love. Jesus lived only for this, to bring home to us the truth that we are loved by God, that this love is to be relied on no matter what we may do. God loves us as we are, not as we should be, and he will always love us as we are, and not as we should be. This is what Paul captures in his second letter to Timothy when he writes, we may be unfaithful, but he is always faithful, for God cannot disown his own self. This theme of God's wild, passionate, furious, unconditional, pursuing, healing, reconciling love is the central, central theme of the scripture. And if we grasp it, we'll be able to love one another in return because his love poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit will enable us to love one another with the very same love with which we are loved and thus fulfill the command of Jesus, love one another as I have loved you. It's a message that is very simple, very sound, accessible to anyone who's reached the mental age of 12. What the Lord is asking of you and me is to open our whole hearts, our whole lives to the message because there is no other way. It's really beautiful, isn't it? We've been given a vision of life that promises a peace that will can offer in this world and eternal joy in the next. Even an agnostic historian like H.G. Wells would admit, quote, as an historian I must confess that the gospel of the penniless preacher from Galilee stands irresistibly at the center of human history. I just wonder how many of us really believe it. For how many of us is it just a head trip? Inspiring thoughts, lofty ideals, but not a shattering, life-changing experience of Jesus as the Christ. This afternoon, how many of us are going to walk around Santa Monica with a lively, conscious awareness that God loves me unconditionally as I am and not as I should be, beyond worthiness and unworthiness, beyond fidelity and infidelity, that he loves me in the morning sun and the evening rain, without caution, regret, boundary living a breaking point, no matter what's gone down, he can't stop loving me. How many of us are going to lead other people in the neighborhood to suspect that we really have found the pearl of great price? How many of us are going to walk around with the bright eyes and singing heart of the prodigal son? How many of us are going to lead others to suspect that we really have found the pearl of great price, that we've stolen upon that treasure of extraordinary value in the field, or to use it more modern simile, that we find a long lost Van Gogh painting in our attic? How many of us are honestly free of this nagging sense of insecurity, inadequacy, inferiority? How many of us are no longer shadowed by those dark spirits of shame, guilt, remorse, and self-condemnation? How many people in this building have honestly broken through into what Paul calls in Romans 8, the freedom and the glory of the children of God? 
Well, if there's anybody I know on a personal basis whom I thought had made his breakthrough into a life of carefree faith and reckless, raging confidence in the love of God, I thought it was myself. I'd like to share a shattering learning experience that I had. I was in Morgan City, Louisiana, giving a weekend retreat. It was one of those unforgettable experiences of the presence, the peace, the power of the Holy Spirit. Monday morning, some friends are driving me to the airport in Lafayette, Louisiana, and I am singing like uh, Bruce Springsteen. I'm bursting with joy. What a privilege to have been part of that weekend. When I stepped into the plane, I guess the door didn't close quickly enough. The evil one stepped on. I no sooner had the seatbelt fest when I hear ugly noises from inside me like, Brennan, you're a phony. The only reason you went to Morgan City was to impress people with your gifts. I mean, Brennan. You told those people that Jesus, at the height of his ministry, at the busiest time of his prophetic career, still found time to steal away and be alone with his father in prayer. How come you haven't spent more than ten minutes in prayer in the last three days? Oh, the rhetoric he used to describe the gospel life is beautiful, soaring, inspiring, but doesn't match the reality of your own. Why not get honest, Brennan? You're trying to compensate to the church for recognition, honor, success you can never achieve in the corporate world. You're a phony. You're a hypocrite. You're a dilettante. You're a fraud. Well, I was mentally tired, emotionally exhausted from the weekend. I didn't put up any resistance, and a deep depression settled inside me. The joy of that weekend retreat vanished like last night's dream. Well, I'm on my way to Philadelphia to speak at the plane makes a stop in Chicago. I decided to get off the plane. It's a very uncomfortable place to be. I'm walking in an O'Hare airport with my suitcase in my hand, wondering, what am I going to do now when the light goes on? Ah. I go out to the south side of the city and see my old friend, Mrs. Brennan. Take a cab out to her house, ring the doorbell. But to really understand what I learned from that woman on that visit, I have to take you back to a winter's night in North Korea in January of 1952. We showed me after midnight, a light snow falling, and two Marines were crouched in an enemy bunker, about 100 yards inside of enemy lines. I was one, and my best friend Ray Brennan was the other. We were both college dropouts. I'd gone to boot camp in Paris Island, South Carolina. Ray had gone to boot camp out here in San Diego. After boot camp, we both got assigned to Ammunition Demolition School in Quantico, Virginia. There we became tight, really fast friends. He came up to Brooklyn, New York to visit my parents. I met his. And then we came out here to Oceanside, California for advanced infantry training. We arrived in Pusan, Korea in the fall of 1951. That night in the bunker, we were preparing in about two to three hours to creep and crawl out in front of us to sweep the terrain of anti-personnel mines so our... Uh, battalion could move up for an assault in the morning. We're passing a chocolate bar back and forth. Ray took the last bite. I reach in my haversack for another one when a hand grenade lobbed by an undetected North Korean some 20 yards to the north of us landed squarely in the center of the bunker. Ray was the first one to spot it. Almost nonchalantly, he flicked the candy wrapper aside. He fell on the grenade. It detonated Instantly, his stomach smothered the explosion. I was completely unharmed, untouched. He looked up at me, winked, rolled over dead. Four years after that, in 1956, uh, yeah, it was January of 56, I entered the Franciscan order in the Catholic Church to study for the priesthood. And four years after that, in July of 1960, I took the vows of religion. If you ever go to the vow ceremony of a male religious in the Roman Catholic Church, one thing you notice is they take off his suit coat and robe him with the habit of the order, part of the symbolism in Paul of putting on the new man in Christ Jesus. Those days, it was also a rule in our community that you had to change your first name to another saint's name, again, part of this new identity symbolism. And since no two men in the community of some 300 priests could have the same name, all the common names like John, Michael, Peter, Robert, James so were quickly taken. And the community assigned you some rather odd names like Pancratius, Eubaldus, um, this is Father Hippopotamus. Well, 
Vatican continues just starting the Catholic Church. There was the warm winds of spring are blown after a long cold winter. That was the first year we were allowed to choose our own new first name. So I changed my first name legally, canonically, every other way from Richard to Brennan to remember to pray to my friend every day and in the hope that the spirit of self-sacrifice that in his life would also characterize my own. I also adopted his mother as kind of my second mother and began to divide my two weeks summer vacation between my own mother alive and well in Brooklyn and Mr. Brennan in Chicago. But I'd never go visit without writing a couple of weeks in advance or telephoning. But on the way back from Louisiana in the throes of that depression, I just arrived unannounced. She opened the door. We had a warm embrace. And then we went to the living room and we spent the afternoon in almost the identical fashion that we had spent previous visits. She turned on the TV. We sat in the sofa. She's an 84-year-old widow. Sat in the sofa. We held hands and we watched all the soap operas. As the world turns, the guiding light, the doctors, the plumbers. 5.30, she goes out to the kitchen to prepare dinner. Third person at the table is her 62-year-old son, Edward, who of all the retarded children I met in my life is the most severely retarded of all. Edward uh, weighs 60 pounds. He's about three feet tall. He's deaf. He's speechless. He's blind. He's either toilet trained or ambulatory. He sits in a stroller all day and sometimes gently taps himself on the head with, on the forehead. By the way, you never suggest that Mrs. Brennan you feel sorry for. Self-pity is simply alien to that woman's mindset. And God forbid you ever suggest she put the little boy in a home. She says to kid, that's my loving gift from my Abba's hand. Well, we put the little guy to bed after dinner. We anoint him with oil. We pray with him. We go back in the living room to have a cup of coffee. This is just a brief digression that just popped into my mind. It's the way Mrs. Brennan prays, which is really unusual. One night, it's a Saturday night, we're sitting watching Columbo. We're both big, big Peter Falk fans. In the middle of the program, the phone rings out in the kitchen. She is a really spry, mentally alert woman. She runs out of the kitchen, picks up, it's her sister. And her sister says to Mrs. Brennan, Francis, I got this terrible migraine, top of my head, down my neck, through my back, base of my spine. I couldn't sleep 10 minutes last night. I want you to go and ask Jesus to heal me. Mrs. Brennan says, consider it done. She was in the living room, and she kneels down in front of the TV. Why? Because atop the TV is a statue of the infinite Prague. Now, this is a devotion the Catholic Church supposedly in the 1500s, the infant Jesus appeared in Prague, Yugoslavia, and all these miracles happened. Well, Mrs. Brennan's got the statue, it's about that high, in a gold, in a glass case over it, and there's a different mantle, a cloak, for the different uh, liturgical seasons. So in Lent, she has a, a purple cloak. For Christmas, she has a white one. And for the martyr, she has a red one. For the Feast of Mary, she's got a blue one. And Mrs. Brennan has all these different cloaks, and she scrupulously changes them on the right day. She kneels down, and this is how she prayed. Now, I'm going to see what's happened to Colombo. <laughs> she said, Dear Jesus, just started the phone, right? Yeah. My sister. Migraine. Head, neck, back, spine. Can't sleep. Jesus. I want you to heal her. And kid, if you don't, I ain't changing your clothes tomorrow. <laughs> Her pastor, it's a huge church there in about 3,000 Catholic families. He told me one day that when he starts feeling sorry for himself and self pity overtakes him and he feels he's overextended and underappreciated. He goes over to Mrs. Brennan's house, never rings the bell, just walks back in the alley and looks into the window and watches her, who weighs 103 pounds, lifting up the 62-year-old boy to set him on the table to change his diaper about five times a day. Well, anyhow, Mrs. Brennan and I go back into the living room, have a cup of coffee, and we start to reminisce about the good old days when Ray was alive. 
And I was telling her something rain I had done out here in Oceanside uh, just before we went to Korea. We really should have been arrested, but I'm not going to go into any detail on that. And she was telling me something Ray had done when he was six years old. He'd thrown a brick through a neighbor's window, and the neighbor justifiably wanted $3 payment. But it was Depression times. The Brennans are hard-pressed financially. Well, she goes into elaborate detail in this story. I just tuned her out. I couldn't shake the Depression and it settled on the plane. So finally, I interrupted her, and I asked, Hey, Ma, do you think... Uh, do you think Ray really loved me? She looked at me and she started to laugh. She still got a fate Irish brogue. She still calls me Richie. She said, Richie, you're the craziest man I ever met my whole life. You're always fooling around. You can't ever be serious. And for reasons I still don't fully understand, I said to her, but I am serious. Then for the first time in all the years I've known her, I saw fear in her eyes. She lowered her head and in a quiet, intense voice said, Don't you ever talk to me like that again. And don't you ever talk about my Raymond like that. You stop it. You stop making fun of me. And I pressed on and said, I'm not making fun of you, Ma. Then she was on her feet. The fear was gone. The anger was blazing in her eyes. She looked at me and she screamed, Jesus Christ, man! What more could he have done for you? Now you tell me that. What more could he have done for you? And then she lowered her head in her bosom, began to sob, and it was the same question, unbearably, endlessly repeated. What more could he have done for you? After what seemed a long time, she reached out and began to stroke my shoulder like a child's. She said, say, oh, it's all right, Richie. I guess we all need some reassurances now and then. That was the night that I burned my security blanket, put on my pants, and began to act like a new man in Christ Jesus. Are you disappointed, even scandalized, that I could be so insensitive, so disbelieving? Well, don't point the finger at me. Every time you wonder where you stand with God, every time you doubt that your affection for Him is returned, every time you dismiss the good news of God's unconditional love as simply too good to be true, then you put the Abba of Jesus through the same shades of the emotional spectrum that Mrs. Brennan threw from rage to tears to amusement. But the poignant painful truth is you don't really trust Him. You sing the songs about the unconditional love of God. Even in the dry and weary land, I'll wait for you. But you don't have the mind of Christ Jesus. We said, don't live in fear, little flock. It's pleased my Abba to give you the kingdom. Why? Not because you're terrific. Not because you're saying the right things or doing the right things or becoming the right things. You inherit the kingdom because my Abba, in that lovely Greek word, eudokia, in his good pleasure, with sheer delight, wants to give you the kingdom. Looking back on that night in Chicago, I am convinced that God himself put those words on Mrs. Brennan's lips with a slightly different emphasis meant for you as well as me. May I ask you right now, just for a moment, to gently close your eyes. In unselfconscious treatment, turn at everybody else around you. And in faith, put yourself on Calvary, on that hill outside the city wall of old Jerusalem, Stand there with Mary, the mother of Jesus. Look up at the cross. His eyes are so filled with blood and tears and pain, he can barely see you. In the background, the crowd is laughing, taunting, mocking. You save others, but you can't save yourself. If you're really the Son of God, come on out from that cross. You 
look up at the cross, Jesus' eyes are so filled with blood and tears and pain, he can barely see you. And hear those words, Jesus Christ, man, what more could he have done for you? Reach out your hand, put me on this mother Mary. Say something like, Mary, I've been going to my church, hearing a lot of inspiring, uplifting things, and I really want to follow your son, Jesus, but I'm really pretty flaky, shallow prayer life, inconsistent discipleship, wide mood swings, I laugh at a few in the morning, or a wedding, I cry at a few in the afternoon. Mary, I'd like to be stable. I'd like to commit myself fully to your son. Just speak a word to me that'll convict me in my faith. And see Mary turn to him and in a quiet, intense voice say, Don't you ever talk to me like that again. And don't you ever talk about my son Jesus like that. You stop making fun of me. Lift your eyes beyond the cross to your Heavenly Father. Say something like, Abba, I know the cost of discipleship today is high, even exorbitant. There's a lot of stuff out there that still grabs me. Money, power, sexual pleasure, honor, esteem, the approval of others. I will commit my life without reservation to your Son. Just give me one sign is all I ask. And see your Abba extend his right hand to the cross and hear him say, that's the only son I ever had. What more could I have done for you? Lord Jesus, this morning, we know that as we gather in your name, you're here in our, our midst. Jesus, with great confidence, we ask that you set each of us free from any bondage of cynicism, skepticism, any darkness of unbelief. Jesus, deliver us from those nagging spirits of self-hatred and remorse, unhealthy guilt, and shame. Jesus, in your great compassion, walk down the aisle of this church. Come and lay your healing hand upon each of us. Anoint us with an unflagging faith and unwavering trust. A heart great and loving. Jesus, you are the great Brennan in each of our lives. You threw yourself for the great aid of our sins that we might not die, but have eternal life with you. No man has ever loved us, and no woman can ever love us as you do. Jesus, that night in the cave in Spain in 1968, I heard you say, this isn't a joke. It is not a laughing matter to me that I have loved you. And the longer I looked, the more I realized no one has loved me as you do. I ran into the darkness and shouted into the night, Jesus, are you crazy? Are you out of your mind to have loved me so much? Jesus, this moment let us see you loving us with your eyes, with eyes of immense compassion. Jesus Christ, man, what more could you have done for us?